This is the Medicast, May 9th, 2011. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the Medicast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of the MedicCast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, the pod medic, and it's great to have you here listening to the show or perhaps viewing the show on our video version. Of course, you can always find the audio versions, the, the standard of the MedicCast that's been around for over five years, going on six years now. And uh, of course, the brand new video version, which has been around for almost a year, you can find that over at the MedicCast website or just get there easily by going to MedicCast.tv. Either way, you can find all of these things as well over at the MedicCast blog, MedicCast.com slash blog, where you'll find links to everything discussed in this and every other episode in the show notes link right there at the top of the page. So go ahead and click that and you'll find the most recent episode listed first, and you can scroll on down and find other episodes listed there as well. And find and follow up on the information you hear and see here on the show. If you'd like to get back in touch with me, of course, send those emails in to podmedic at mac.com. You can also always call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC, and I will get back to you. I try to respond back to every single email I get, and of course, if you call in on the voicemail line, we can share your voice and your comments or thoughts here with the other listeners on the MedicCast. That's it. We'll get into some more contact information and follow up later on as we close out the show. But let's, without further ado, jump on in and we'll get into our news segment first off here coming right up. Let's get on into the news, and we're going to kick off with a story I picked up our last month, or l during the month, uh, looking at Australia. And uh, we talk a lot about ambulance and ER overcrowding and the effects it has on us. Uh, what does that really mean for us, though? What are we thinking about when we talk about ambulance overcrowding and, uh, and, and ER overcrowding when we deal with uh, overuse of our units? Uh, well, what happens when the ERs are full and they can't take the patients anymore? They end up staying in our ambulances and on our stretchers for an extended period of time. They're not really made for long patient stays, and so patients become even more and more uncomfortable, and uh, hospitals are waiting for them. This is a problem that's happening and being reported on in Australia, in Victoria, and they're focusing on why patients in one of the hospital centers there have an average wait time to get off of the stretcher of 44 minutes. That's ridiculous. I mean, that seems pretty darn extreme. Um, in another one, there another hospital, nearly 40 minutes for both of two other, uh, two other hospitals discussed in this particular article. Um, some patients waited as long as two hours to get taken out of the ambulance or off of the ambulance stretcher and given a bed in the hospital. And in the meantime, these ambulances are out of service, so they can't go back out and provide more calls and service to their community. So um, this is an ongoing issue. It's not just happening in your neck of the woods, folks. It's happening all over the world in every place that has some kind of uh, rapid response healthcare system. There's just a lot of people that need assistance, and there needs to be a different way we apply the use of our 911 service here in the U.S. It's 911. In other places, it's 999. Um, whatever the case or whatever your emergency number is, people are overusing it almost routinely in a lot of developed nations. And we need to find another way to educate people and educate our public about how not to use an ambulance. I mean, I think we, um, I often talk about educating our public about how to use the ambulance and what to expect when we show up. But I think this is a situation where we really need to talk to them about use of appropriate resources and how not to use the ambulance. Next up in this particular article is, uh, or in this particular episode, is a look at a, an ambulance accident that occurred in Scotland. And the Scottish Ambulance Service paramedic who was 
quick on his feet and nimble in his driving skills, was able to avoid a very serious T-bone accident that could have happened as he was responding to an emergency. A car pulled out in front of him from a side street as he was responding at a high rate of speed, but he was able to avoid the vehicle crashing into an empty parked car. Um, no serious injuries and the uh, local authorities are applauding the uh, skilled driving of that paramedic and I think that that's a good thing to say and it's good to see a motor vehicle accident involving a, an ambulance that doesn't involve serious injury or death for the crews. So it's always good to see that in these discussions and it's again a a good point to reach out and periodically educate your public on how to be aware of ambulances responding, appropriate ways to pull over and let the ambulance pass you, and all kinds of things, as well as, of course, the other side of that page, educating your drivers to be better at good defensive driving techniques. You know, we're not in the ambulances or any other emergency vehicle to be an offensive driver, unless perhaps in certain situations with police officers. At no time should an EMS vehicle be an offensive dri driven vehicle. It should be a vehicle driven very much in a defensive manner. And I think we need to remember that even if we're trying to get somewhere fast, we need to make sure we're appropriately monitoring our uh, due regard for traffic laws, for traffic signals, and never assume that that side street or that intersection up ahead is as empty as it looks. Always make sure that oncoming traffic is going to stop and, you know, err on the side of caution. So kudos to this paramedic and, and uh, the crew and everybody seems to be okay. And uh, hopefully uh, this won't happen to this individual again. And uh, if it does, quick reflexes seem to be on his side. Finally, in this particular episode, let's go ahead and look at a final article. You know, there's a lot of discussion earlier in the month of April and towards mid-April about the shooting and ambulance response or lack thereof in Detroit. And if you haven't been following up on this, there's I've got links in the show notes for this and all the other news articles. But um, basically, there was a drive-by shooting in Detroit where uh, six men were inside a vehicle and another vehicle pulled up at 2 a.m. next to it and shot at, start, started shooting at them, blowing out all the windows. One man died, another or several others were injured. Uh, local police responded and then they said all the ambulances that were being sent were tied up on other calls and they took the individuals back to the police station after waiting for a little bit. It's unsure or there seems to be a lot of finger pointing about how long that little bit of time was. And uh, then after waiting at the police station for a while, the police just opted to take those victims to the hospital themselves. Now, according to Detroit city officials, the ambulance was dispatched. It did take a little bit of time, but uh, maybe up to four or five minutes, there was an ambulance on response to the shooting scene. But by the time the ambulance got there, the police had already loaded the victims up and taken them back to the precinct. And by the time an ambulance was en route to the precinct, the police officers notified EMS that they were going to transport them to the hospital themselves. So an ambulance didn't show up, but an ambulance was on the way. And I think people have, again, a misconception that when they dial 911, there just happens to be an ambulance parked around the corner and they're going to be there immediately. You know, our response time is dependent upon how heavily used and loaded our system is and uh, how quickly uh, we can get there depending on traffic and other conditions. And we, again, need to negotiate uh, with our public to, or, or educate our public, not negotiate, but of course negotiations come in too, um, but certainly educate our public about how to appropriately use ambulances and what to expect. And, and the fact that, look, our average response time is eight minutes, but that means we could be longer or shorter depending on where we are coming from from the previous call or from our station in relation to your location. Let the public know that. Give them a reasonable understanding of what to expect and tell them, look, you're going to have to help yourself for a short period of time until we can get there. There's just no help for that. But to sit there and complain and point fingers and say that no one was coming, well, you know, that's usually not the case. It's just a lot of people uh, upset because of a death, because of serious injuries and a scary situation. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get this resolved for the city of Detroit. 
Time now to jump into this week's tip of the week, and we want to continue on with part two of our series on National Registry Airway Skills, and in this particular episode, we'll be talking about more of the advanced airway skills. In the episode two weeks ago, we discussed the first half of the segment, which talked about preparing yourself for skills testing at both the ALS and BLS level, and then a review of the standard BLS skills for these stations. I should point out that, of course, ALS professionals, there are aspects of the BLS skill stations that are employed in the ALS airway management stations. So make sure you are up to date and prepared to demonstrate your BLS skills because that's what you're going to do first before you're allowed to go ahead and say, hey, I can do these ALS skills too. And so without further ado, let's jump into that segment and talk a little bit about National Registry ALS airway testing skills. So let's move on and look at part two, the ALS airway management stations. Now in some places there may be some version of the ALS management station as a BLS skill. Depending on your state or regional protocols, you may have a combi tube, a dual lumen airway skill as part of your EMTB skill set. If that's the case, you may have some of these skill stations there as well. Be aware of that. It may be an add-on skill. It may be a, a, a rider or something that you get after you've been an EMT for a certain period of time. You can apply to become uh, able to apply one of these devices. In any case, you may be not just an ALS provider using these skills. So they have many, many uses. Let's talk first about ALS ventilatory management. This is the biggie. This is the ET tube. Um, it's use of a bag valve mask. It's correctly intubating the patients, verifying that you're going to have the tube in place correctly via multiple methods and going ahead and bagging the patient safely and doing so in a timed setup. First of all, always BSI. You need to make sure you're observing body substance isolation. You want to make sure you're opening the airway and using a head tilt chin lift. You will then also either verbalize or actually insert an oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway using correct technique of measuring from either the corner of the mouth to the tip of the ear or the corner of the nose to the tip of the corner of the nair to the tip of the ear. Either case, um, you need to correctly insert or verbalize insertion of this particular airway opening device. You're going to then bag valve mask ventilate the patient at 10 breaths per minute. Again, I'm using the ECC guidelines for these patients. And you could apply oxygen to the bag valve mask first if you have a chance to do that quickly. Um, you can hook up oxygen and get that running before you start bagging the patient or you may do that at a later stage. If you haven't already bagged the patient uh, or hooked up oxygen and you've bagged the patient for 30 seconds, um, the examiner will then tell you that the blood ox oxygen saturation is at 85%, which is an indication to now you need to apply oxygen, that bagging them with room air isn't enough, so you're going to go ahead and in attach oxygen correctly, setting it to uh, 15 liters per minute, and then you're going to ventilate the patient. Again, I say at a rate of 10 breaths per minute. Um, they will say 10 to 12 breaths per minute, but that means basically ventilating them once every six seconds or so, and that'll keep you safe. Um, five or six seconds will keep you right in that range. Now, after 30 seconds of bagging the patient on oxygen, um, the examiner will make sure you're actually giving correct breaths um, to the patient, you're actually um, getting uh, present breath sounds, and they'll tell you that medical direction has ordered you to ventil um, begin uh, using an ET tube. You're going to endotracheally intubate the patient. So you're going to direct your assistant, usually the preceptor, to take over bagging the patient. And you're going to want to pre-oxygenate these patients. What is pre-oxygenation? It's different for every place. I've looked it up, and I've, it used to be 20 breaths a minute. Now, since we're not ventilating it at a higher rate, I say give them the high end of the range. Give them 12 to 15 breaths per minute at this rate. So that's once every five, three to five seconds. Okay, that'll pre-oxygenate the patient, make sure that there's plenty of oxygen in their lungs. Um, follow your instructor guidelines for this one. I think you can't go wrong uh, just making sure that they are giving good steady and um, breaths to the patient at the rate of around five seconds or every five seconds or so, you should be good. 
you're now going to select the proper equipment and check it out, okay? Now, you've already done some of this, but you're gonna go back and you're gonna select the uh, correct endotracheal tube for this patient. You're going to wanna make sure you have a stylet in place. You're gonna verbalize that you have lubricated the tube. Um, you're going to go ahead and make sure you have the proper equipment. Did you check the cuff to make sure that it doesn't leak when you use the syringe to blow up the cuffs on the tube? Did you make sure that the laryngoscope bulb light came on on the selected blade that you're planning on using, whether it's a Mac or a Miller blade? Do you have a light? So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have all of that. Now, when you've checked all these things out and you're ready to intubate, you're going to go ahead and tell your assistant to cease bagging the patient. They will remove the bag mask, they will pull the oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway out of the way, and they, you will go ahead and get the patient ready to intubate. You're going to go ahead and proceed to intubation. You're going to make sure the head is in a sniffing position. You're going to insert the blade carefully. You want to sweep the tongue to the side gently, and you want to lift the man mandible, not leveraging the blade back against the upper teeth, but you want to lift the mandible straight upward. You're going to, once you visualize the cords, insert the ET tube carefully from the right hand side and directly visualizing the cord pass the tube passing through the cords and advancing it just past the cords you're going to then go ahead and stabilize it inflate the cuff direct your assistant now to ventilate the patient while you hold the tube and you're going to ask them to begin ventilating while you confirm placement using auscultation. You want to auscultate times three. I always say times three because you're going to auscultate left, right, and over the epigastrum. You're looking for presence of breath sounds over the lungs, lack of breath sounds over the epigastrum. And you should be able to verbalize this to your instructor that you, how you would recognize this correctly. Your instructor will then ask you if you had proper placement, what would you hear? And could you demonstrate one additional method of verifying proper tube placement in this patient? You would have another selection of equipment there. It might be entitled tidal CO2 inline ETCO2 attachment. It might be a, a colorimetric CO2 detector device. You're going to want to show correctly how to attach it, and you're going to want to be able to identify what color that changes to or how that device would be registering properly, for instance, on a cardiac monitor with an ETO2 attachment or a portable um, carbon dioxide detecting device. Once you've done this, you're going to secure the tube in place. You're going to go ahead to the next section, which is suctioning. Now, once you've properly uh, verbalized uh, your findings and interpretation, that your color has changed, that all the other things have happened, you're going to go ahead and be told that you hear and see secretions in the tube. Um, the patient is exhaling and you see secretions and you hear gurgling. So you're going to then correctly identify a flexible French catheter. You're going to pre-oxygenate your patient you're going to, again, the pre-oxygenate the patient at 12 to 15 um, liters per minute, um, and the 12, um, you're going to have 15 liters per minute in the bag valve mask, 12 to 15 breaths per minute um, on the pre-oxygenation. You're going to measure from the suprasternal notch up along the neck and to the corner of the mouth or to the end of the tube for this particular uh, measurement. You want to get all the way down to the location of the carina in the uh, where the bronchi branch out to left and right. You're going to use your thumb and forefinger to mark that position on the flexible catheter, and then you're going to carefully insert the end of the flexible catheter without suction in place into the ET tube. And then once you've reached the depth you've marked with your thumb and forefinger, apply suction, and then suction as you withdraw from the tube. You want to do this in less than 10 seconds from when you stop bagging the patient. You're going to ventilate the patient then after you've suctioned at 10 breaths per minute. Now, in this particular situation, um, you also want to make sure that you are directing that you are going to, after you've inserted and withdrawn the catheter, you want to make sure you're flushing that catheter for use a second or third time 
in a separate open container of sterile water that has been opened just for this particular patient. So we're going to flush it out by sucking up some sterile water in there and, then le and letting it clean out the inside of the tube and before we reinsert it into the ET tube for a second or third attempt. So you want to verify and verbalize that you know how to do that. Critical criteria for this particular station. Failure to initiate ventilations within 30 seconds after applying gloves or if you interrupt ventilations at any time for longer than 30 seconds. Failure to take or verbalize BSI. Failure to voice or provide high oxygen concentration. So you need to make sure that you're giving them oxygen flow at 15 liters per minute eventually with the bag mask. Failure to ventilate the patient at the rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute. Failure to provide adequate volumes when you do ventilate. You want to see that chest rise, the lungs fill, and you only get a two errors per minute permissible, which if you're doing 10 breaths a minute, that means you, can only, you have to get at least eight of them correctly inflating the lungs. You want to make sure you don't fail to pre-oxygenate the patient prior to intubation and prior to suctioning. You fail to intubate the patient successfully within three attempts. You fail to disconnect the syringe immediately after inflating the cuff of the ET tube. If you use the teeth as a fulcrum at any time when lifting the mandible. Failure to ensure tube placement by auscultation bilaterally and over the epigastrum. So remember, auscultate times three, and that'll protect you from that. Also, if you use a stylet, make sure that the stylet is not extending beyond the distal end of the tube. Remember, the stylet needs to stay within the tube so that it is not going to cause damage to the airway once it's inserted. You pull the stylet out. And um, you want to make sure that you insert any kind of adjunct or tube into the patient in a manner which is not safe to them. That's a fail point. If you suction the patient for longer than 10 seconds, or if you fail to suction the patient when they tell you, hey, there's secretions in the tube, dude, you've got to make sure you suction the patient. So hopefully you know you're supposed to suction the patient in this station, and you'll do so correctly. Let's move on to the dual lumen airway device. This could be a combi tube, could be a king airway, could be an easy tube. It could be a lot of different things depending on your particular uh, protocols or your testing station, testing area. So there's some things about this particular station that you're going to have to know the particular device. They're all slightly different and you're going to need to know how to use that device correctly. And I don't have time to figure out which device you're using. So that's your job. I can give you the basic overview and the test station here, but you're going to need to know the rest of the tips. First off, of course, BSI. You want to open the airway correctly with a head tilt chin lift and then correctly measure and insert or in some cases verbalize that you're measuring and inserting an oropharyngeal nasopharyngeal airway. You're going to use a bag mask to correctly ventilate the patient at 10 breaths per minute. You will now be told that the patient has a um, is being um, ventilated without difficulty and you want to make sure you also ex uh, attach oxygen appropriately properly once you've achieved the bag masking um, for 30 seconds you want to oxygenate the patient with oxygen set at 12 or more liters per minute for the bag mask and you're going to go ahead and ventilate that patient at 10 breaths per minute again. Now at this point you will be uh, told that medical control has ordered you to insert that dual lumen airway and you're going to tell your assistant usually the preceptor, take over ventilating the patient, which means you need to instruct them how frequently and how much to ventilate the patient. So you're going to say you want to ventilate them every six seconds and you want to watch for chest rise and ventilate them until you see the chest rise. At this point, you're going to select your equipment. Now, this may be different for different devices. Some of them have two cuffs. Some of them have one. You need to know what your equipment is needed. Correctly set select and test the equipment for your device and check your device carefully. You want to make sure your cuffs cuff or cuffs fill and that they have no leaks and you want to verbalize, usually verbalize, that you are lubricating the device correctly. And then you're going to correctly place the tube. Now I'm going to use, in this particular scenario, I'm going to go over just basically um, some things about uh, what I do here in the state of Maryland. If I can find that particular piece of paper which I can't. All right, so we're going to back up here from where I coughed. You're going to 
uh, select your equipment, check your device carefully using the correct instructions for that device. You're going to make sure the cuff or cuffs inflate and remain inflated, that they're not having any leaks before you go back and deflate them for, in, um, for insertion. You're going to verbalize, usually verbalizing is enough, to verbalize lubrication of the device, and then you'll correctly proceed to placing the device in the patient. Now these are usually considered blind insertion devices, so usually it's a question of correctly opening the patient's mouth and inserting the device carefully so as not to displace the tongue, but to insert them down to the bite mark, which is usually a mark location of where that tube should sit next to where the teeth lie in the mouth. So as you see that point come up, that's the insertion point on most all of these devices. Once you've inserted the dual lumen airway device, you're going to go ahead and you're going to um, insert the device carefully, inflate your cuff or cuffs, ventilate using the primary tube, auscultate times three, remember, both sides of the lungs, left and right, and then over the epigastrum, and verbalize what you're looking for and what you expect to hear. You should hear, if it's correctly air ventilating the patient, you should hear air entering the lungs bilaterally, and you should hear no air movement in the epigastrum. If there are no lung sounds present, then you will ventilate the second tube on this patient. And again, auscultate times three, verifying that you are still the, the, using the second tube, you have correctly ventilated the patient. If not, and this would depend on your device, usually you would deflate the cuffs, reposition the tube, and usually that means backing the tube out a little bit, and then reinflating your cuff or cuffs and repeating again with your primary and then secondary tubes, auscultating both times for lung sounds. Once you have correctly assumed that you have lung sounds, you will ventilate the patient 10 breaths per minute and you would secure the device. Now, there are some fail points here and you need to keep that carefully in mind. Failure to ventilate initially within 30 seconds or ceasing ventilations at any time for longer than 30 seconds is a fail point. Now, there's 30 seconds is a long time. So if you have all your things lined up and you've checked the equipment, the patient's pre-oxygenated, even if you have to reposition that tube and then check both sides again, you still should have enough time to do that in 30 seconds. If not, you remove the tube and bag the patient again and then try a second time. If you fail to take or verbalize body substance isolation precautions, if you fail to provide high flow oxygen to the patient or ventilate them correctly at the rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute, if you fail to properly adequately volume uh, and provide adequate volumes for the patient, that also would be the case and you have two errors per minute. So that means you need to bag them correctly eight times a minute out of 10. Um, if you fail to insert the dual lumen airway to the proper depth or in the proper place and get successful ventilations within three attempts, or you fail to inflate the cuffs properly, and then, of course, you want to make sure you're removing the cuff, the syringes from the cuffs, if that's something that is required for your device, and you want to make sure that you're correctly securing the device. If you fail to confirm that the device is properly being ventilated by either the first or the second lumen, um, you want to make sure that you are correctly doing that. And again, anytime you insert anything into a patient with an, with an unsafe manner, that's a fail point. Um, goes without saying, I don't care what you're inserting, whether it's an, a syringe, uh, applying cardiac shock, or whatever else the case may be. That, that all catches up with you in the end. Let's talk about pediatric ventilatory management as we wrap up the airway segments here for the National Registry Skill Stations. Always, always, always BSI, folks. And then you're going to go ahead and open the airway with that neutral sniffing position for this infant or pediatric patient. Um, correctly open the airway, correctly measure and apply an oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airway. Again, measuring the oropharyngeal airway from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe and the nasopharyngeal airway from the corner of the nair to the tip of the earlobe to correctly measure these devices. You will now bag, ma um, use a bag valve mask and ventilate the patient at the proper rate. We're going to say, depending on whether you're using a pediatric or an infant mannequin, that we're looking at 12 to 20 breaths per minute for these particular patients. You want to go ahead and attach oxygen to the mask at this point. If you haven't already, set the flow rate to uh, at least 12, but usually I would say just set it to 15 liters per minute for a bag valve mask and go ahead and ventilate the patient again at 12 to 20 breaths per minute. 
Now, at this point, you're going to be told again by the examiner that um, they are examining that you have correctly ventilated the patient with a bag mask, but you're being told by medical control, insert that ET tube. So you're going to go ahead and hand over the ventilation of this patient to your assistant, who will be the preceptor most likely, and you will instruct them to correctly ventilate the patient and the correct volume would be until you see chest rise and the correct ventilatory rate will just say to ventilate them because we're pre-oxygenating at this point at the top end of the range to tell them to ventilate every 20 seconds which will be right around um, every three seconds or so. Direct your assistant to do that while you get your equipment out and check it. You want to get and select the proper ET tube. Um, there's many different ways to do that, um, but you would select the proper ET tube for this particular size pediatric patient. You can measure using their pinky finger or any of the other various methods to select the tube. Usually you know which tube you're going to use for the patient, if, especially if this is a test center that you've used. Bef um, this is often the case. If you're testing in the place that you went to school, you know the airway mannequins. You know which tube it is. Just you're going to correctly select that. You might be asked by the preceptor, how do you know what size tube to use for this patient? So be prepared to do that. You're going to check your devices. Make sure that your cuffs inflate. If you are using a cuff tube for pediatric patients, some places do. And you're also going to want to make sure that you verbalize lubrication of the tube. You want to make sure you're checking your laryngoscope blades, whatever size or type you're using to make sure that you correctly have light at the end and you're ready to go. Once you have all this stuff ready to go, you'll instruct your assistant to cease bagging the patient and they will remove the bag valve mask, remove the OPA, and they will stand back so that you can begin intubating. With the head in the sniffing position, go ahead and carefully insert your blade, displacing the tongue to the side, lifting the mandible straight up without leveraging against the, the gums or the teeth in the upper um, portion of the mouth, and you're going to go ahead and visualize the cords. You insert your ET tube carefully, visualizing the tip or the cuff passing just through and advancing past the ET, tor ET cords. Um, the, the, um, advancing the ET tube past the vocal cords. I've been talking a lot here. A lot of things to keep in mind here. If there is a cuff, you will inflate the cuff at this time. You will then direct your assistant to begin ventilating the patient while you manually secure the tube and using your stethoscope, auscultate times three the tube placement. And again, that would be bilaterally over the upper chest and over the epigastrum. You want to hear lung sounds up top no lung sounds down below. You will then be asked if you had proper placement, what would you expect to hear? And you may also be asked what other ways would you be expected to verify tube placement in this patient? Again, colorimetric device or other type of sensing device that would help you do that, um, such as an inline um, capnograph tube or something like that. Secure the tube in place and you are finished this skill station. Now again, lots of good resources and links over at the MedicCast site on this episode and last week's episode as well for the ET tube, um, for the BLS airway skills. And you can find those links over at MedicCast.com slash blog. Click the show notes for this to find these episodes in the show notes links there. And you can go ahead and find more over also at the National Registry site, nremt.org, as well as some good information in the cardiac guidelines available from the American Heart Association. And if you really want to dig into some of the details of why and how this stuff works for airway management, check out the circulation journal from the American Heart Association. You can actually get that online and check out all of the reasons and whys for the recent 2010 ECC updates. And good luck to you if you're testing. Please don't forget to let me know how you do when you test on these skills. And uh, hopefully something here at the MedicCast has been able to help you out along the way. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. I want to thank everybody for checking out the show this week. Remind all of you to head over and check out the information and links from the tip this week from the 
episode news and everything else over at the MedicCast blog. You can find that at MedicCast.com slash blog. And I urge you to head over there. There's a link for the show notes right at the top of the page. Click that link and you can find the most recent episode listed first. And if you need to find a previous episode, scroll back and find those older episodes. And you can follow up on the news links. And of course, I always provide additional resource tips and links for you in the show notes for every episode because I can present a quick overview of some tip or something here, but I want you to have the resources you need to go and find in-depth information so that you can back up and see how it applies directly to your own practice, scope of use, and protocols so that you can make sure that you are operating safely and correctly within the guidelines that are available to you. Now, you can also always get back in touch with me. I love to hear from you. If you'd like to reach me by email, send those emails into podmedic at mac.com. You can also always call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. And I love to hear from you. Don't forget, you can always become a fan over at the Facebook fan page for the MedicCast. That's facebook.com slash MedicCast. And you can find me directly over on Facebook and Twitter under the handle PodMedic. Facebook.com slash PodMedic and Twitter.com slash PodMedic. We're going to go ahead and close out the show. And our PodSafe music this week is from Cody Prevo, and he's our favorite Canadian country western star. Uh, we, we've played a lot of Cody's music here on the show, and this is one of his songs, Breathtaking. If you like what you hear, you can check out a link in the show notes to Cody's website, or go over and check out the link that's there to take you right to the iTunes uh, store, and you can check out some of his music there. And if you like what you hear, Go ahead and buy one or two of his songs. Show your appreciation and thank him for sharing his good songs here on The Medic Cast. In the meantime, I will go ahead and close out the show reminding you I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. We'll be continuing our National Registry series periodically every couple of weeks here. And next up, we'll be looking at some of the cardiology stations, again, for both the BLS and the ALS emergency students out there that are testing soon for their national registry. And of course, EMS week coming up here very quickly. So go ahead and give yourself a pat on the back for EMS week and uh, make sure you're doing something special for yourself and your colleagues to celebrate EMS week. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. The one thing you do need to remember, of course, scene safety, BSI. And I'm restless Won't look at you And I'm breathless I feel so alive Till you open your eyes And I'm dying For the millionth time You stole my heart And broke them chains You blew those black clouds Far away And I was speechless It was all so You winded me and made my head spin I dropped down to my knees and then I was shaking Cause you're breathtaking I used to keep my head down There's so much more to see now So I lift my chin And take it all in And I'm slain Again and again You stole my heart And broke them chains You blew those black clouds Far away and I was speechless It was all so painless
You stole my heart And broke them chains You winded me And made my head spin 